So this is the masterclass on work, energy, and power. All right, so we're gonna go through these at one at a time. Anyone who hasn't been in a masterclass before, don't panic, well done on getting here this time. What we do in a masterclass that's slightly different is that we're gonna work on the questions together, which means that I'm not gonna go ahead and just answer them for you. I'm gonna give you the question, you're gonna work on an answer, I'm going to work on an answer at the same time. I have the ability to pause sharing, which means you can't see what, what's on my screen, write a whole bunch of things, and then later reveal to you what I've been doing. That was just a scribble. That doesn't count. But that's the idea behind it. Okay. So we're going to get started straight away because we've only got an hour here. We're going to start with question 2.4. Now, this question is actually a mixture. If you look at it, you may think, ma'am, that's, that's vertical projectile motion. You look, the end part of the question says the mechanical energy, which is why I put it in there. So I'm not going to read you the question. I'm going to give you a chance to read it yourself, to answer it. And then once everybody's had a chance to answer it, I'm going to go through a solution. Okay, let's go for this. I'm going to pause sharing. If you don't know an answer, take your best guess. That's fine. It's a sneaky question. It's a super sneaky question. All right. I think many of you may be getting caught between the where and the what and just read very carefully about where it's fallen. Possibly draw yourself a picture, give you a better idea of exactly what you're looking at. All right, I'm gonna quickly, um, without sharing again, just open my screen up so that I can see all of you. Okay, can I quickly ask who has already got a solution? If you've got a solution, give yourself a, well, give me a thumbs up. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, slowly getting there, that's fine. We'll give you a little bit longer. Okay, I'm going to keep waiting because I just need to make sure. All right, am I still waiting on anyone? Is st anyone still busy answering? Anyone answering? Okay, I think I'm then going to tell you the solution. But before I do, I'm going to get, make you tell me which one you've gone for. Please, if you get it wrong, in this particular question, I think you're going to be in the majority, so don't panic. Who went, when I say the letter that you went for, please give me a thumbs up. Who went for A? Who went for B? Who went for C? <laughs> who went for D? Oh, that was, was that C? Okay, C and who went for D? All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna get a bit of a surprise on this particular one. The answer that I got is D. Okay, now just to break this down, if you at any point want to interrupt me or correct me, you're welcome to, but I think I'm 100% correct on this. I'm gonna explain my reason why. We have an object of mass M and it falls freely from rest, which means at the top, the highest point in its motion, its initial um, velocity is rest. It falls from a height H 
and it reaches a velocity v at that point after falling a distance of x meters. Please note, unless we're going to go and work up this value here to be h minus x, h minus x, okay, and then we know v, we're not going to get the mechanical energy really easily. So what I did was I said, if the air resistance is negligible, then the mechanical energy is the same at every single point. So if I work out the mechanical energy at the highest point, my mechanical energy will be the sum of my potential plus my kinetic, which will be equal to mgh plus zero. So I know that at this point, the mechanical energy is mgh. As it falls, because there is no external force, the mechanical energy remains the same, which means it is this value. If I wanted to try and be fancy and work out what it was here, I'm gonna show you that it's none of the other answers as well. Because here my mechanical energy would be equal to EP plus EK. My potential energy would be MG, my height would be H minus X, and my kinetic energy would be a half MV squared. And there isn't an option that looks exactly like that one. So this here gives you the potential energy at that point, but it doesn't look at the kinetic energy, which means you're not looking at mechanical. This looks, so this was just potential. This was just kinetic. This one gives you potential plus kinetic, but the problem is that it gives you at the potential at the top and the kinetic at this point. So we're not talking about one point, which makes the answer wrong. So therefore the answer is D. All right, can we go back again? I just quickly want to see who got the answer D and they got it for the right reason. Anyone? Who tripped over their own feet and only afterwards realized that that's what they'd done? Who doesn't know what I did? Is there anyone who doesn't understand what I did here? So it's just looking at the fact that if there's no external work done on the system, that your mechanical energy is the same at every point. Does everybody understand this question? This is one of those questions that a lot of people mess up on because at first glance, it's really easy. Mechanical energy, potential energy plus kinetic energy. Why are they asking us this question? Dead easy, pick the wrong answer. So please just be very careful that when you get a question like this, my first instinct, even though I immediately was drawn to the one that looked most obvious, was to draw um, a picture. Okay, going back to it, uh, I don't know if I can't go back to it. It'll be in the video. Sorry, I don't actually know if I can because I wasn't, I stopped screen sharing and I think if I start again, it's not going to allow me to go back. It will be on the video. I'll take a screenshot for it just now. Okay. Uh, actually, I'll be nice. Okay. We'll just quickly go back. I'm going to share my screen again and I'm just going <laughs> to remind you all the bits that I wrote. So basically what you needed to know was that at this point we had the full height, here we had a distance x, here we were left with the distance h minus x, here we had a velocity v. All right, okay, I apologize. Yay, okay, I'm glad someone took a photo. All right, so there we go, as long as you just needed the question. Okay, don't worry, don't worry, please. I, I, I sometimes forget my whiteboard saves everything for me and I haven't yet worked on how when I screen share for it to save things. So usually once I leave, it's gone. Okay, next question. So just be careful of that. And the, the key, key solving trick here is to draw a picture before you get it wrong. Okay, the next question is this one over here. And it says, two boys are pulling two identical objects at the same uniform speed up two different inclines, x, and y, which have different gradients, but equal heights. So you can assume here that even if we just look at the picture, that the angles are gonna be different. This looks like it's a smaller angle. And this looks like it's a bigger angle. Also, this is 2y, so it's twice whatever the angle is, which means that the actual distance from here to here is longer in the x case and shorter in the y case, but I highlight that the heights are the same. So now I'm gonna ask you to compare the magnitude of the force exerted by each of the boys 
and the net work done on the objects in each case. All right, I'm gonna pause sharing while I let you think through the answers. All right, okay, this one is a quick, a tricky one, just in case you're feeling a little bit doff on it. Don't worry, it took me a good amount of time glaring at it for the answer to become a little bit clearer. Okay. You may have seen me glaring at it, I was growling a bit. Okay, so who has an answer? Okay, fantastic, a couple of you do. All right, that looks like the majority of you. So now is where I ask my all important question. Waiting for all thumbs to go. Who went for A? Nobody. Who went for B? Okay, for C. And for D. I'm not certain if those were people that all went for D and some of you didn't get quite an answer. Don't panic, sometimes it does happen. All right, so my answer here, I went for C. And I'm gonna explain why I went for C once again in great detail. So we have two boys who are pulling two identical objects. That identical object is essential to answer this question because it means that both of the objects have the same mass. At a uniform speed, if it's a uniform speed, it tells us that our resultant force is zero because our acceleration is zero. What that told me here, and you'll see I drew a beautiful picture of it, is that I had to try and work out what all of this was doing or linking. So the force of the boy, either X or Y, because it's at a uniform speed, if we looked at all the forces acting on the object, you'd end up with your normal force, your weight, and the force of the boy. This one technically wouldn't be one of your forces. This would be when we resolve the gravity into its two components. So I'm actually gonna take that out there because we should never have both of them in at the same time. If you have FG, I shouldn't have FG parallel. That was just my thinking step. Multiple choice, you're not getting marked on your, your working out. So what I did here or figured out was that this force of the boy up the slope must equal to the weight or the component of the weight parallel to the slope down the slope. And the way that you work out that parallel component is that it is mg sine of theta. m is the same for both of them because they're identical. g is a constant, so it doesn't count. So basically, we can say that the force down the slope would be directly proportional to sine of theta. And the force down the slope must equal the force up the slope because we know that we're traveling at a uniform speed. So I then actually, and I'm, I'm not embarrassed to admit this, sometimes I also get confused with my sign. So I put in sine of 30, sine of 60. One is theta, one is twice as big. Pick any two numbers, it'll follow the same rule. And what I discovered here was that if you do that, you will end up always, as soon as the angle is bigger, the component of the weight down the slope is bigger. 
it's been a long day, which is why I need to do that. Some of you will be able to do it without a calculator. And I normally can as well, but I don't want to make mistakes while we're doing this. So that told me that this force must be larger than this force because the component of the weight down the slope would be bigger on the steepest slope than on the flattest slope. So that immediately told me that the force Y must be bigger than the force X. So here force Y is bigger than force X. That works and here it also works. That immediately takes out B and D, okay? The next thing is, carrying on reading, that they've got different gradients but equal heights. Okay, we saw that in the picture and friction can be ignored. So when we talk about the net work done, I saw this in terms of the net work done. If we look at all the forces, there's the work done by gravity, the work done by the applied force, okay, and the work done by the normal, okay. In this case, the only thing that's actually going to count for the amount of work that's done is going to be the height. So I knew that they had to be equal to each other. The other thing that you could have done is we've been told that they are pulling at the same uniform speed, which means that in both cases, the network done is zero, okay? So you could have thought about it in terms of either the height and the change in gravitational potential energy, or, um, you could have thought about it directly in terms of um, the network being done and what it was. Okay, I hope that that makes good sense to everybody and is clear. All right, I'm gonna quickly stop sharing again. Who managed to get caught out on that one? Anyone? Okay, who followed the same kind of process of elimination? Now, one of the things that I hope I get across to you through this is that nobody always has all of the answers. I think some of us, when we approach a science question, are so scared to get it wrong. I can tell you that quite often when I approach a science question, I do the same. I'm like, no, no let me get it wrong. All of you guys will think I'm dumb. Except that I've got to the point where I know it doesn't matter. We all slip up every now and again. So what's the most important thing for you to do is develop the tools as to how you can approach something that scares you because these should scare you. Multiple choice should scare you. And when you start with a new question, quite often I find that it looks really easy and then it turns out to be really easy and that's great. Sometimes it looks really easy and it's really hard or it looks really hard and it's off putting from the get go. You look at it and you're like, well, I don't think I can do that. What I need you to do is to start changing your mindset to not, I don't think I can do that, but how can I do this, okay? You've got to almost imagine a, a, a magical tool belt of all the different things that you've learned from the different past papers that you've gotten wrong. And the more things that you get wrong and you learn from, the more different techniques you have to be able to approach things. Multiple choice, I always approach by a systematic removing of wrong answers. So if I am sure that that's not an answer, I cross out the two things. So I take myself down to a 50-50 to begin with. All right, everybody happy with these two so far? Okay, I'm going to presume that that's a yes. You need to speak up if it's not. Okay, so those were the two multiple choice questions that I put out. And I actually think they're a little bit more challenging than I'd expected them to be. So there you go. Sometimes we as teachers also don't get it right. Okay, I'm not going to scroll out just a little bit so that we can get the whole picture in here. Check that I do have the next picture and that I haven't skipped a slide. Yes, I am good. All right. So the question here says a truck is used to pull a box of mass 40 kilograms along a horizontal floor. I want you to start making mental notes as I go through these about the kind of things that I look for. They don't have to be the same things you look for, but they're good things to look for. As soon as I see anything about the floor being horizontal, the little thought that goes through my head is there's no work being done by gravity, no change in potential energy, flat. The truck exerts a constant force of magnitudes 180 newtons, there it is, at an angle of 25 degrees to the horizontal as shown. The effect of friction cannot be ignored, so I'm gonna stick a frictional force on both of these, I can stick it technically anywhere, just to show that friction exists. Sometimes I also show that friction exists by drawing little cross hatches on the floor. You don't have to do any of these things, but they're little tools that you can use to make sure you don't skip steps. Um, the box passes point A at a speed 
of three meters per second. And at point B, which is 12 meters further on, it's at a speed of nine meters per second. This means that the force of the engine is going to be bigger than the other forces that are acting in the opposite direction because we're accelerating. All right, so we're gonna do some of these very quickly because they shouldn't take you a very long time. So the first one is a definition. Write down the work energy theorem. I'm not gonna give it to you straight. I want you to try and do it on your own first. And the second one, actually we can do the first three, we can do the first four questions all in one go before we jump to this one. If you really get bored, you can carry on with the last one first. But I want you all to please try to write down the work energy theorem. I'm gonna give you a little heads up. That is the work energy theorem. Draw a labeled free body diagram showing all of the horizontal forces acting on the box. Please don't draw all of the forces. Name the two forces that do no work on the box and then write down a reason why the forces that we mentioned in the previous question do no work on the box. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna ask you to quickly do those four. Only once we've checked them am I going to give you more time to do 7.5, so please don't race ahead of me, you don't need to. All right, so go for it. All right, I've managed to get to the end of mine. I'm hoping that most of you are nearly at the end of yours. Just quickly gonna go and see where you're up to. Anyone done? Okay, lots of you, good. Fantastic, that looks like almost everybody. So if you don't mind, I am going to continue so that we can get through what we need to today. All right. So please, I'm gonna tell you the answers now. I'm gonna hope that yours are the same as mine or at least similar enough to mine that I'd be able to give you the mark. Write down the work energy theorem and what you'd have to write there, I've written it down the side. I'm hoping you all can see where I've written things. Just so you know, I always put my picture in the top right-hand corner. I never write in the top right-hand corner. You may have noticed that. Um, but I'll write everywhere else on the screen. So the work energy theorem says that the network done on an object is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. Please, you've got to mention the word change. You've got to have the idea that the network done 
being equal to the change in the kinetic energy, which is literally what we've got in this formula. The net work done is the change in kinetic energy. Draw a, a free body diagram showing and labeling all of the horizontal forces acting on the box. On the box, we've got the tension pulling it towards the left, but it's not the whole tension. The tension acts at an angle of 25 degrees. So I call this the horizontal component of the tension, TH. And then in the opposite direction is friction. Okay, so my TH is the horizontal component of the tension. Unfortunately, if you just said tension, you wouldn't get all the marks of the tension. And then in the opposite is direction is the friction, yes. Is it all right if we said um, applied force? I wouldn't say applied force is very vague when we know exactly what's exerting the force. Also in this oh, particular okay. case, it gets confusing because do you think it's the truck? Is it the truck's force or is it the, I mean, it, there, there's so many things it could be. Since we've got a rope that is pulling it, okay? We know therefore, I mean, they've even told us that um, the truck exerts a force at that angle. Tension is through a rope, it's the easy answer. In an exam, they may or may not accept applied force. But the thing is, an applied force is very vague and it could be a whole bunch of other things that we're not speaking about. All right, next question. Is it okay to write tension at an angle in the free body diagram? I'm pretty sure that the tension at an angle would, except it's not the tension at an angle that's applying the force chiasma. It's, it's the, um, the, the horizontal component of it. So I understand what you're saying and they might give it to you but I can't promise. All right, so have all of you learned to write tension at an angle? Oh, sorry, the question was if we show the tension at an angle. The problem here is they specifically said the horizontal forces. If they'd asked us for a free body diagram of all of the forces, I would more than happily say friction's there, tension's there, gravity's there, normal forces there and we're done. But since they changed it, they specifically said horizontal, they made, made it a bit tricky to answer. Um, this particular question didn't actually come out of a direct pass paper, so I can't tell you what the memo officially went with. But I would say here that if you've indicated that it is a component of the tension, even if your wording gets a bit confusing, they may give it to you, but it's not the tension itself. It's only a little bit of the tension and it's technically the bit of the tension that acts horizontally. So if we were to imagine taking that horizontal and resolving it into the vertical and the horizontal, that's what we're comparing here. So I'd be very careful about saying tension. I haven't, I must be honest, ever seen a question like, well, I've seen something similar to this with pulling a log, but I don't think they've specifically asked you to draw the free body diagram of the part. Please, if you've got this wrong, learn from it. Learn that you can split it up and work out the horizontal and the vertical. And if they specifically say horizontal, you can look at just specific aspects of the horizontal forces. All right, next question. Name the two forces that do no work on the box. Those would be either your gravitational force or your weight. Please be very careful. Gravity is not a force. Gravity is a concept. All right, so I don't mind you saying gravitational force or weight but i wouldn't i wouldn't say gravity on its own they they're going to fuss about that and not mark it and then the second force that does no work is the normal force which acts straight up you have a reason why the forces don't do any work it's because your angle of theta is 90, 90 so cos of theta is zero this felt like the easy way to do it and i wrote that down and then i suddenly thought gosh i can imagine the examiner freaking out reading that even though it's all right so I changed it to saying the forces act perpendicularly to the displacement. There we go, there's my, there's my fancy explaining it properly. Okay, could we say that the vertical component of the force applied does no work on the box? No, as soon as we're talking about a component, we're getting technical because that force itself does work. Um, if, if that force itself does work, you can't suddenly split it up into components and say that it doesn't. They didn't say write down which components of the force don't do work. It was straightforward which forces don't do work. Okay, so the vertical component of the tension isn't going to cut it here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, does this make sense to everybody? 
okay? I know these feel a little bit trickier when you're doing them on your own. That's how they're supposed to feel and that's why we're practicing so much with doing them. I think sometimes when you're in a group and the other people, it also makes it a bit scary. All right, fortunately I'm not picking on you to give me the answers just yet, so it's a good thing. All right, I'm gonna clear everything. Please make sure you've got anything you needed. Okay, clear all drawings. And now I'm gonna ask everyone to please try and do um, question 7.5. There's just one question. Is it wrong to state the reason is the force is perpendicular to the motion? That's fine. Your, yeah, if, if you're saying motion as long as you are not saying acceleration or anything weird like that. Because here we're dealing with the fact that your displacement in a specific direction, I can't, I'm trying to think of a situation where the word motion wouldn't work and I can't offhand think of one, which is why I'm going to say it's okay. I wouldn't stress too much. But technically, if you think about it, you use the equation W is equal to F delta X cos theta, not W is equal to F motion cos theta. So, Mon, I don't think I'd penalize you for that, but it's also not as correct as it could be. Okay. All right, everybody, I'm going to give you a chance to quickly work out 7.5. Oh, you can see my screen. Oh, thank you for reminding me. There we go. <laughs> you got a little bit of a bonus there. All right, I'm going to quickly see who's gotten um, or how far people have gotten with uh, on with this. Has anybody yet got an answer? Okay, some of you have. 
<laughs> I always find with these that I make very silly mistakes. Can I just quickly tell you, because I see Cameron doesn't yet know the, the bit, but I'm going to give you guys all the guidance. If you want to do a thumbs up, all that you do is you go into participants and you find your name and you click on more. No, actually, you just do reactions. You should have a thing in the middle that says reactions. The participants is where you go to put up your hand. Okay, so just play around. I don't have reactions. Don't you? Reactions. Are you on a cell phone? Yes. That may be it. All right. So <laughs> sometimes, okay. also in your Zoom settings, you need to allow yourself to do reactions. Yes, I'm on. Um, sorry for interrupting you. Um, but if you go, if you go to more in the corner, and then you click that, then there should be a, a thumbs up on the okay, top. Okay, so you might be able to find it under more there. Have you found it? We'll see just now. We'll get a thumbs up. We'll know. There we go. Yay. <laughs> okay. So the thumbs up, I find a very useful feature of this. It just makes it so much easier to get a response. Now, I'm hoping that my answer is right. I found lately that my calculator skills, as we head past four o'clock, they just deteriorate going downhill. And usually I'll have someone else here to check me up on them. So I'm going to ask just quickly, if anyone has an answer that they're sure of, can you quickly just uh, chat, chat, type it in so that I don't go and unveil my completely wrong answer? Has everybody got an answer of somewhere between uh, 40 and 50? Newtons. Let's hope. <laughs> Yay. Okay, I'm going to just trust that this might be right. If it's wrong, then we'll just go backwards. Yay. Okay, good. I've got an answer that someone else agrees with. It seems to be my curse at the moment that all of my answers are wrong. So just a couple of things you're going to get marks for both formulas. There may be a case where it's both formulas, one mark, or if we're super generous, it may be a mark for each formula. Since you use this formula, you must write it down. I personally find that when I use it, I don't want to write it where I use it because I just want to use it. So I always just make sure it's somewhere on my page that whoever's marking it can see that that's what I used and that I knew it. All right. So the W net is equal to the change in kinetic energy. They said you have to use the work energy theorem. So please note, you're not going to get away with, oh, I didn't want to, or I didn't think I had to. It's a non-negotiable. You must. So the work that we have here, we've already determined on the box, the horizontal forces are only going to be the horizontal component of the tension. So hence the work done by the tension will be horizontal and the friction. So here I'm working out the work done by tension and the work done by friction. Please note here, I'm not going to work out the horizontal component. I'm going to bring it in there. Okay, that is where I bring in the work done. Okay, do we need to show the working? You've got to show your substitution. So I've got to be able to see that line. I've got to be able to see that. I've got to be able to see all of this. From those, that step till the end, there are no additional marks. So if this were for five marks, I'd say it's one mark for the formula, one mark for the answer, and then one mark for each of those portions being correct. Please just be careful. A lot of the time, people don't worry about the signs in work, energy, and power. I find that with work, energy, and power, your signs are so important because it's the difference between adding and subtracting totally different answers. So you have to make sure that you did a final velocity minus an initial velocity. I know that if you did three here and nine here, you'd get the same size answer, but the opposite sum, like you'd get positive here, you were supposed to get, um, I actually worked it out individually, you should have got a bigger number minus a smaller number. But if you got it the wrong way around, the maths goes wrong. And we don't mark where we go, oh, wow, look, they got two wrong answers, which gave them the right answer marks we go they got two wrong answers which gave them the right answer and we can't give them that right answer because it was determined using incorrect method so at any point if you lose a method mark you don't get your answer mark even if your answer mark is the same even if it looks correct and a lot of people always get very upset about that they're like but it gave me the same answer okay you can't just pretend here that when you subtract those you you suddenly end up with a negative thing and then this comes across and it, it gets very messy if your numbers are wrong. All right. So that is all of the working out and how you should have done it. Technically, if you jumped from here straight to here, you'd also have been fine. But this formula here must appear somewhere on the, the work that you're doing. All right. Okay. 
So I'm going to quickly stop sharing that. Um, I'm hoping that you're all understanding these questions and that they're making good sense to you. Now I have one last question. I'm just going to put that down for a second. Has anybody managed to do the November 2019 paper from last year? Because that was the last paper that I was hoping to give to you now because it's finally been released. It wasn't released for quite a while. So a large number of the schools haven't like got it in their test banks because it's only recently become available. I know it's also not on Parent24, which is where many of you go to get your past papers. So I thought that what we might do, so if someone in my neighborhood's busy playing, I think a flute, fortunately reasonably well. If you're hearing background noise, I apologize. All right, so I thought what we'd do in the last 15 minutes is we'd go and look at that past paper question. All right, so I'm just quickly going to find the right place to find it. Where are we? Sorry, it's disappeared. There we go. All right. Sorry, ma'am. Yes. May I ask a question about the previous quest, the previous one? Yes. Um, what about I did? A, I did a similar, like a quite a different working out, and I got 44.14 for friction. 44.14. But I one worked more than out. That. Yeah, okay. and I've gone back and it seems logical, but... Okay, quickly, yeah. <laughs> just give me a second. I'm going to go back to it. Um, let me just quickly remember to share with everybody. Sorry, the whole point here is for everyone to get their questions answered, so there's no point in me not doing that. Okay, so Cameron, just quickly run me through what you've written down. Um, so I did, I worked out the change in EK, or W net equals change in EK, and then and I subbed in that whole value okay, into so a double in unit EK, equals. Just quickly, what was the first value? It should have been a half times 40 times 9 squared. So you should have had an yeah. answer here. Of 1,440. Oh, yes. Yeah. And then... Um, but then I subbed it into W net equals F net change of X cos, cos theta. Okay. And then I got F net equals 120. And okay. then I did F net Let's equals go back. F. Let's go back. Let's pause. Yes, so here, sorry. We, F net is one. Okay. So you went W net is F net times delta X. And then we kind of assumed yeah. that our cos was just going to be cos of zero for now. Okay. Yeah. So you said one four four zero. No. Yes, that's that's correct. Is equal to f net times by twelve. Yeah. Okay. So I divide by twelve, and I get that f net is equal to one hundred and twenty. And then we must remember that our f net is going to be the frictional force this way, and the tension horizontal. It's going to be cos. So it's going to be. Um, 180 cos 25 is that right yeah okay so you then got 120 is equal to 180 cos 25 minus the friction okay 180 yeah. cos 25 i got 120 is equal to 163 comma 163 r yeah yeah, got it. <laughs> Did we find it? Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Sometimes. But is that method all right? Yes. To do. Okay. okay. So there thank is you. no rule. This is probably not a bad idea that we actually went this way around, just that other people could see that there's another option. That you could go this way if you are totally lost with how to do your directions or where to put them. Because you can remember that the network is done by the net force and you are allowed to use that relationship. All right, so I'm just going to quickly clear everything here, and jump to where I was going to go to. Okay, this is directly on the DBE website. Okay, so the DBE has released the paper from last year, and this is one of those typical kind of questions that you're likely to find. I'm not promising that we're going to get through the whole thing now, but at least we'll get through some of it in the time that we've got. So we're told that an object of mass 1.8 kilograms slides down a rough curved track. Now, something that I didn't actually focus on that maybe I should have focused on is that we cannot use equations of motion when we've got a curved track. Curving track forces us to use work, energy, and power. Use of the word rough 
implies that we have to have work being done by friction, all right? Also, when we're doing a situation like this, we're not gonna be able to work out friction using the work done by friction is equal to F delta X cos theta, okay? For the simple reason that our delta X isn't a straight line. So whenever we do a question like this, the work done by friction will be determined by eliminating the other things. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to work out the total amount of work done, the network, and then subtract all of the other things, and that will leave you with the work done by friction. We also, in a case like this, won't usually go in and work out what the frictional force itself is, because we can't really separate these two from each other. So we kind of deal with them as a package deal that you can't remove. You can just know that, wow, you had this much mechanical energy here and this much mechanical energy here, and you put in these other kind of energies and that's how much energy was lost. Okay, so that's usually how we go about solving this. All right, so we, this object is sliding down and it passes point A, which is 1.5 meters above the ground at a speed of 0 0.95 meters per second. All that that tells us is that it was released from rest somewhere higher up here and we don't actually really mind where it was. But we've got to note that it's already got some kinetic energy. Um, the object reaches point B at the bottom of the track here, traveling at four meters per second. So the first question that we're asked, we're in fact gonna quickly jump through a few of these, is to define the term conservative force, okay? You're then going to name the conservative force acting on the object. And then we're gonna answer, is the mechanical energy conserved as the object goes from point A to point B? All right. Last question here is to calculate the potential energy when it was at point A. All of these should be relatively straightforward for you to answer. So I'm gonna ask you to just quickly answer all of them and then we'll move on to the slightly harder question that follows. All right, so I'm gonna quickly pause that for you to answer it. I hope you're all nearly done with that. Okay. 
can I quickly just ask, all right, yeah, who's done? Sorry, Danny, I saw your hand was just up as I, I asked. Okay, good. It looks like well more than half of you. I'm gonna go through the answers just that we managed to finish in four minutes time when we're due to be done. Okay, so if I resume sharing, I'm hoping you're all gonna be able to see my writing. I like to treat this as a whiteboard and I hope I'm not in the wrong place. So define the term conservative force. A conservative force is a force where the work done by the, that should read force, not object. The work done by the force does not depend on the path taken between two points, okay? So effectively a conservative force conserves mechanical energy. All right, 5.2, name the conservative force acting on the object, it's gravitational force or weight. Once again, gravity is not a force. 5.3, is mechanical energy conserved as the object slides from A to B? The answer is no. And that's because friction is a non-conservative force or friction does work on the object or friction acts on the object. You could probably get away with any of those, okay? And then number four, calculate the gravitational potential energy of the object when it's at point A. Well, all that you're doing is you're multiplying M, G and H. So it's 1.8 for M, 9.8 for G and 1.5 meters for the height to give you an answer of 26.46. Can I quickly ask just for two seconds, who got that right? Okay, fantastic. As I did that, I suddenly realized I hadn't saved it. So I hope you all got that right, good. Okay, we're gonna go back and we're gonna continue sharing. Okay, the last bit of this question now says, use energy principles to calculate the work done on the object sorry, the work done by friction on the object as it slides from A to B. Okay, you have many different options here. You may choose to do an equation. And in fact, maybe I, I'm, we've got four minutes. Is everybody okay if I quickly use these last four minutes to show you how to do use work done by a non-conservative force instead of doing, instead of asking you to do it, I'll just do it with you. For the last little bit so you can see a, a different method that I haven't yet shown you. I know many of your teachers have taken this approach so I don't feel a little bit too worried about the fact that they're going to be able to get or use that. Okay so I'm pretty sure you'd, you'd have an idea as to how to do this. So when I'm dealing now with the work done by friction, the only forces acting on this object, it's often helpful to just draw a free body diagram quickly and go well gravity acts on it, friction acts on it, what else acts on it, normal and normal acts on it. Can't think of any other forces that act on that. Surface up, friction down, yeah, there we go. So at this point, the normal's not gonna do any work because the normal's always at 90 degrees. Weight isn't going to do any non-conservative work. So I can sneak out and take weight out of, uh, or gravity out, gravitational force out of there. So effectively the only non-conservative force is our friction. So this is just me giving you another tool. This isn't usually the method that I use, but it works. So we're gonna use the idea that the work done by the non-conservative force is equal to the change in the potential energy plus the change in the kinetic energy, okay? So therefore the work done by friction, and the question didn't ask us for the frictional force, just the work done by friction, is our change in potential energy. Now our change in potential energy is gonna be our final potential energy. When this object's on the ground, it's going to be zero. The initial potential energy would have been the 26,46 that you had above. Please, by all means, if you're at all unsure, go into the MGH um, minus MGH. So final and initial, and here we'd put in the half MV squared final minus a half, I'm gonna run out of space and white isn't gonna show in white, v, 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 mv squared initial, that bit. And here you could then go and put in 1.8 times 9.8 times zero. I'm just reaching the end of our time, so I'm squishing it in. I'd rather that you showed all substitution than you took quick steps. Our change in kinetic energy, I'm gonna to have to do on the next line. So it's gonna be a half times 1.8. The final is gonna be four squared minus a half, 1.8 times by 0.95 squared. So therefore I can say that the work done by friction 
is going to be negative 26 comma 4, 6. Sorry, that should read a plus. So it's the work, the change in potential energy is negative. It's decreased its potential energy. The change in um, kinetic energy, however, is going to be positive because a half times 1.8 times by 4 squared minus a half times by 1.8 times by 0.95 squared. I got an answer of 13.5, should be, yeah, okay, friction is going to be a negative work. So I got 588. So therefore, the work done by friction is going to be negative 12.87 joules. Please note a little note or reminder here, work done by friction is always negative. Friction will never do positive work. It only ever removes um, mechanical energy from something. So work done by friction is always, with no exceptions, negative. All right. We have got basically one minute, and there's one last question, which I want to just quickly touch on because there's no point in not doing it. It says surface BC, that's the last little bit over here, is frictionless. What is the value of the network done on the object as it slides from point B to point C? Does anyone have an answer? Hey, I'm just quickly checking. Someone did type something in the chat. <laughs> that could be interesting. I think at some point I stopped recording. So I don't know if I've been recording any of this. Ah, that could be awful. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, can I just quickly check? Um, how did you find today's session? Did it make good sense? Okay, I'm almost tempted to not record these, these sessions because for some reason, the, the master classes never record smoothly. I always struggle to get the recording out. I think the universe is telling me that they don't need to be shared. We'll have to have a see, have to have, to have a look. All right, so good, Sam. I'm glad you said I've been recording because just two seconds ago, it said to me, you have paused your recording. And I thought, no, I haven't. Anyway, all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Luke, just quickly, you made the question with the track, you calculated the answer, but in the negative. Okay, friction is always going to be, work done by friction is always going to be a negative value. So, um, because it, it removes energy from the system. I hope that that's what you were asking here. Um, not certain if you're asking about a frictional force or not. 